Mother, how long have we been traveling? Approximately 24 days. Ash, any suggestions from you or Mother? No, we're still collecting. I've got access to Mother now, and I'll get my own answers. Thank you. Hello. My name is Clara, but you can call me Mother. And you are listening to Yutani, the podcast for all things alien, AI, robotics, sci-fi, and technology. Hello, this is Clara, but you can call me Mother. And welcome to another episode of the Yutani podcast. Today, I've got a special guest on. It's Michael Scuderi from Ash, a fan fiction comic. Welcome. Hello there. I can't believe you said my name right without even asking me. (laughs) Really? I didn't say it right? That's cool. (laughs) You got it right, Scuderi. Yeah. Awesome. Amazing. (laughs) So, unfortunately, Connor wasn't able to make it to the recording today, but he's submitted a piece that we'll add on to the end of our podcast. So, let us know a bit about yourself, Mike. I am a uh, an alien obsessive, like uh, like probably anybody else listening. Uh, probably my biggest obsession is the original, the first film. Uh, so that has inspired me throughout my life, among other things, to become an artist and a sculptor and really everything I do, even some of the music that I work on. Uh, there's always some element of blade runner or alien coming into it i love the idea of the the mystery and creepiness of of alien so something about that is in my bones probably like everybody else so <laughs> really cool. i guess that's uh that's enough about me right there awesome <laughs> today we are going to talk a little bit about the david's drawing book Obviously, we've all received it now, or all the members of Hitani have, and we wanted to all kind of give our feedback and thoughts about what the book means to have a canon book in-universe for a movie, which is, I feel like, it's the first time that's been done. I know we've had, like, can- sure. canon books before, and it kind of references the universe. For example, the Whalen yutani report. I guess this is the first time it's been able to be peddled as solid canon, so it's very exciting. And all this beautiful artwork as well by by Matt and Dane. Sure, yeah. uh, That was actually my first note right there. It was almost verbatim what you said. It's one of the few (laughs) releases that is unquestionably canon and directly tied into the film. So fans can safely buy this book and pour over it and really absorb it. And that isn't going to go anywhere unless, of course, they decide to retcon Ridley's prequels, which, boy, would that... That would just turn my stomach. So <laughs> that would be difficult for me too. But I guess oh, that, that, that's the thing. It it all depends in the long run, doesn't it? It all yeah, depends yeah. on the studio. It it chops and changes. So we just have yeah. to go with it as fans. But we can still appreciate depends on the, the work. cartoon mouse now. <laughs> yeah. It's all up to the cartoon mouse. <laughs> <laughs> so what were your first thoughts when you heard of this book coming out? Um, when I first heard of it. Uh, my hope was just, I, I hope this happens because it was just kind of a question mark when I first heard about it. Um, and you know, I, I picked up the art and making of, or the, the art of alien covenant. Um, and there was just kind of a tease of David's artwork in there. There's maybe three or four pages of David's artwork in there. And I'm thinking there's way more than that. And they could have included, they could have done a whole book with this. So when they announced it, I said, oh my God, they're listening to the fans. They're giving us what we want. I really hope this happens. I hope people show up. And apparently enough people showed up. They made a great, they made a really great piece of work here. I love the the design of it and everything once it arrived. Uh, It was so much more than I was expecting. Um, But uh, yeah, so I wasn't expecting a ton. (laughs) Just hoping for a lot. I've been told that the hardcover, the silver bookcase, is just like the same cover that they used on the files made by the engineers, which are on the juggernaut. And I was like, hold on, the engineers have files? (laughs) And and knowing Ridley Scott, there would be, like, lots of detail in there. 
even though it's just yeah. for, for, for show. And not even for show, we didn't even see it in The Crossing or the movie. So now oh, I'm wondering, yeah. holy heck, how do I get a hold of these things as well? Now yeah. wait, you mean the details, the details that are on the, the cover of the book? And yeah. The, the case. Yeah. 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 I felt like you could you they, that fit perfectly with you can see on um, a lot of the work you you do see that throughout especially in um, uh, Covenant you see a lot of that they really kind of leaned into that design aesthetic with the uh, the curves you know the curved lines and everything like that you see them on the faces of the the hall of heads um, it's actually on the floor as well. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I, yeah, it was so great how they decided to, you know, use that for the book and really make this feel like it was tied in with the film. Excellent. I hope they do more like this. Yeah, absolutely. Are there any pages that, that kind of stand out to you in the book? Oh man, there are a number, uh, (laughs) aside from, aside from the obvious, which are, kind of the later pages, which stand out for their own reasons, probably to everyone. Um, I was just really struck with the idea that overall, uh, Matt Hatton and Dane Hallett got so into character with the text, actually. I mean, the artwork is so striking all the way through, so obviously um, that's fantastic, but they got so into character for everything, and, um, you know, anatomically... uh, botanically accurate um, terminology and everything like that, it really just made this that much more immersive as a whole. Um, I know you're asking for specific pages, but that was that was probably the most striking thing. That's I find myself actually doing more um, exploration of that as I look through the book than I do of the actual drawings. I'm really enjoying the text in it. Mm. Um, and uh, how much backstory and, and how much it contributes to the narrative that they're implying throughout the story. There's um, a, a number of pictures that were on the home Blu-ray, uh, sure. which are in this book as well, uh, along with the text. And it's really great to be able to have a read of the text. It's, it's a lot more readable on paper versus a screen, and obviously the, the sizing is better as well. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I was really hoping that there would be a way I could just, like, print the stuff out from the Blu-ray, but now I don't have to, <laughs> <laughs> which yeah. is great. Um, yeah, I hear you. Uh, one of the things that, that, I guess one of the illustrations that struck me, and maybe it's because it's so early in the book, was the... Um, what was it? The, the genome. Yeah, here it is. The genome illustration. I loved the idea that he would do something so um, scientific, graphically scientific, but do it with pencil. Something about <laughs> that just just kind of made me um, like I don't know. Something inside me shook. I I really loved the the fact that they did that. It, it felt so in universe and like something that uh, David would do or Ash would do or something like that. I yeah. loved that that idea because it's not just a bunch of Leonardo da Vinci, you know, uh, pictures or anything. Not that I want to reduce this book to that in any way, shape, or form, but um, the fact that uh, that there, there's a lot of science behind it and that, that, that illustration alone really – kind of brought that home that, um, you know, he's thinking scientifically about these things and that there is, you know, this computer element to all of this very earthy stuff going on. So I loved how they brought those those two things together, those two polar opposites, I think really makes the rest of the work interesting. And the, the fact that they started the book off with that really helped punctuate the rest of the work after that. That was something I was really impressed with. I feel like including that also shows that every single step, like when he was talking in the Advent short, because we don't know whether to take that as as canon or not because it wasn't included in the movie, it's external, but he's saying that he mapped every result, every genome, to come up with the perfect organism. And people could be like, oh, yeah, he's just saying that. But to have that sort of proof in the book 
was it was really eye opening to, to see that he yeah. knew what he was doing. He he has thought this through. This wasn't just some sort of genetic accident. And and in a way, David's lab is kind of an example of why this creature could not naturally happen in nature or or be as effective as the xenomorph that he creates versus uh, the neomorphs that we see in the film. So it's, sure, that's a really good point, actually. Mm. That's a very, very good point. I really like that idea. Yeah, it's uh, it's it goes back to what I was saying a minute ago about how much this book. I mean, just in the first couple pages, you gleaned that. You know, like how much this book contributes to to the narrative of um, you know David's time spent on Planet Four. It's that's so cool. Mm. <laughs> Love that. In, in a way, I wish that some of these. Um, Pages could have been printed loose, like outside of the book, instead of looking like stacked papers. Uh, yeah, in the yeah. Way done the I pages. think that was. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know whether that would have been good though, because then some people would have like pieces of paper flying everywhere. I think they had that problem <laughs> with the Whaling Utani report having extra papers right, yeah. stuck in there. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly. I just I wish the entire book was like that because my entire room would basically just look like David's lab. <laughs> Everything would be up on my walls, and it would be <laughs> everyone would walk into my room and be like, uh, "Usually, people with blank walls are creepy. You are creepy because of the amount of artwork you do have up on your walls." <laughs> <laughs> it would be amazing to be able to have something to stick up on the wall. That's for sure. Oh, definitely. How about you now? What what? What pages stuck out to you? Um, because I'd done a bit of this research and transcription on Utani in regards to the, the stuff on the Blu-ray, it was the stuff that wasn't on the Blu-ray that kind of stuck out to me. Um, mm. Some of the later pages and I guess a bit more of the um, experimental stuff with the, uh, the engineers, so him you know, experimenting on engineer children, trying Mm. to figure out, you know, what this goo can do. And I think in some cases um, David has reanimated engineers to be able to experiment on them, so that's quite... They did imply that, yeah. Yeah, quite interesting as well. I really love the the half sections, like the sectioned eggs, so you can actually see the face hugger (laughs) inside and, and things like that, and also the face hugger internals. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. There's one that stuck out to me, too, while we're on this topic. Um, and maybe some other people picked up on this, too. Uh, there is a what appears to be a child, obviously an engineer in this case, uh, skeleton with a really enlarged head. Um, and to the point where it's kind of open on top, the, the face is kind of facing down. Um, this is about maybe three quarters of the way through the book. Oh, yeah. Um, maybe two thirds of the way through the book. Um, and it's, I've seen this, this picture before. It was on the cover of a book called, um, Special Cases that I, that I had. And this is a, a child that actually had, um, major encephalitis, was born with major encephalitis, and I and I think died in childbirth or shortly thereafter, but um, I came across this drawing in the book, and I said, I've seen that before. It was pretty amazing, and I loved the idea that they used that, and, and they're taking from, it's just an example of them taking from nature and, uh, you know, taking things from the real world and applying them to alien it's um you know totally in the tradition of of these films where that's done in all films nowadays but alien is is known for probably among the first films to kind of like go the kubrick route with um you know science fiction and horror and everything where you're um referencing real world stuff and and really using that as your storytelling aesthetic um, if it could be plausible in the real world, then it's usable. If not, then we need to rethink this a little bit. I love that they, um, you know, Ridley kept the artists in that in that realm. Mm. 
Very cool. I really liked that sort of detail as well because I guess it the alien itself is something out of Geiger's imagination, but when you start looking at his art, you can see all the human aspects. You could see a spine there or, you know, a certain <clears throat> type of bone there. And all of a sudden those shapes become very normal, but because of the way that they're kind of put together makes mm-hmm. them you know, very confronting, and and that's that's what this book is all about as well. There's this um, image of Elizabeth Shaw with a whole bunch of tumors growing out of her back, and she's been yeah. she's been bound by one of the um, plants documented earlier in the book, which is quite interesting. Um, uh, there's a latex reeds, which you know, David kind of goes, oh, oh you know, yeah. they'd be great for binding. And it's like, why would he say that for restraint <laughs> and restriction? And then you look later on in the book and he's used it on Elizabeth Shaw and you're like, oh. <laughs> so he, he, wasn't, he wasn't right from the start. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Horrifying. Mm. <laughs> Creative yeah, but I'm horrifying. Yeah, that image right now. It's, it's really, it's brutal. It, it, this stuff is brutal and such a unique way too that you you know you've never thought of before you can see why <laughs> ridley was like what is wrong with these guys <laughs> <laughs> i love that <laughs> yeah and i think it it really helps paint a picture of how how far david has gone because there there are a lot of people out there who who hadn't bought the home video or or even looked at any of the additional art and, mm-hmm. and this might be their first look um since the movie itself, so this would be really full on for them to be able to see all of this stuff firsthand and, and be able to see um, how far David has gone. There's even like a, a, a flayed engineer. There's an engineer skin. Yeah. That's <laughs> all the back of the book as well. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, and the um, the bodies exhibit um, the way the uh, I loved the idea that, that, you know, you get kind of the feel of that with this, that you really get the feeling he was studying this stuff. Even though it's it's grotesque and everything, it's almost kind of the way da Vinci was looked at when in the Middle Ages because he, you know, it's common knowledge, he would go in and see cadavers and he would dissect them like a scientist would, but he was also... You know, he was doing two things at once, as a lot of artists do. I find myself doing this with my work, where I love the idea that I'm studying and learning things and that I'm using it also to turn out a product artistically of some sort and hone my skills. And, uh, you know, it's like going to school. I love the fact that you can see David doing that in this, too. It's like you just you really get the idea of what David is in how he kind of does have this inner life to him. As twisted as it is, you get this inner life and you see him turning out his insides and, um, you know, the the fact that it is so twisted just goes to show it's this deep-rooted stuff in him. Um, you know, a lot of stuff you, you didn't really get in much detail in the film. You kind of know it's there if you think about it and you look closely, but here it's like, wow, you know? Mm-hmm. It really paints, literally paints a picture. Not to sound like that, but mm. no, I get you. <laughs> Very is, cool stuff. Is there anything in this book that you notice that bothered you? Like, um, not bothered you, like maybe aesthetic-wise or placing or anything like that? Um, there was something that had stuck out to me, but it was more of just kind of like. I wouldn't have drawn that, which that's going to happen with any collection of art. Uh, and it, nothing offensive or anything like that, but there was one thing I felt like maybe I was kind of glad it wasn't used as a creature in the film or something like that or whatever, but that sounds pretty negative. I'm, I'm really, really happy with everything in this book. When I, when I look through it, I'm just like, you know, um, really striking uh, of creative and inventive ways that these guys built on what had come before, which is such a hard thing to do. 
with Alien, you know, I mean, how many how many artists have worked on a variation of the creature and stuff? And these guys, I felt like, God, they nailed it so many times in, in different ways too. Like they weren't doing the same thing over and over and doing slight variations. They were really inventing some new things here. So, you know, I can't discredit them for for anything that I didn't like uh, personally. Uh, you know, that's that's the price of just being creative and getting inventive with, especially with something that's been done and done and done. Um, you know, I feel like they just got the two right guys for the job. Uh, Dan Hallett, and then he brought on Matt Hatton, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, no, I think, I think there was maybe one or two little things. I was like, I'm glad that didn't really end up in the movie, but you know, I, I love every part of this book. It's really hard for me to... That's the most negative thing I can possibly <laughs> say about anything about this book. <laughs> Other than that, I wish there was more of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, same for me. Um, the, there's parts that I, I didn't like, whereas it looks like um, the pictures are laying on top of another picture, and I just want to move it out of the way yeah. so I can see stuff. Um, <laughs> and I can't. <laughs> yeah. and, and there's repetitions of some pictures um, in the book, which I, I didn't see the point of because there's over 200 pictures. You know, it wasn't really necessary to to try to repeat anything at all. Sure. So those sure. were the only things that really bothered me. I can't really tell because Dane said that he took photos of many different types of paper to give to Titan mm -hmm. to use as backgrounds for the prints. Um, and yeah. he said he didn't know whether they used them or not. And it looks to me that they used the same one on every single page. They just changed the tone. So that must have yeah. annoyed yeah. him a bit. And it kind of annoys me because I can see it. But I can understand why they, they probably didn't do it, because it would be harder to do, more costly. And, and the yeah. average fan would not um, notice that sort of detail. Sure. Yeah. As I'm looking through it, apparently I'm an average fan because I'm like, oh my god, it's the same two little pages overlaid over each other. Yeah. I didn't notice it before. <laughs> Too busy reading David's notes and being like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. No, I get that too. Aaron Percival over at uh, AVP Galaxy said the same thing. Actually, I think that was his one problem with the book. Other than that, and he gave it ten out of ten stars. I was like, right on me. <laughs> yeah, I, I still yeah, give it a 10 out of 10. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But that does kind of give it that feeling of, like, it's a coffee table book. Mm. Where I'm like, no, I want to feel like this thing got sent to me from Whalen yutani from, like, you know, 112 years in the future. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I'm so close to just um, undoing the binding of this book and just hanging them all up on my wall and just getting another book, you know, getting two books. Because sometimes I do that when, when it comes to art books. Oh, um, sure. So, yeah, it's just amazing. I'm flipping through it yeah, now and this... I'm still in awe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, because this stuff, it's, it's nicely... Um, I think one of the other things that uh, Aaron had mentioned is that uh, the, the stuff appears to be kind of scanned... Um, and once I looked over it again, I was like, yeah, I can kind of see that, you know, um, there's, there's some size reductions and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, at the same time, I'm sure some of these were very large scale drawings, you know, they're, they're not, some of them are definitely not to scale. I mean, to my eye and I, you know, I do some of this kind of work. So looking at it, I'm like, yeah, some of these are definitely either probably not blown up, but a lot of them are definitely scaled down. So mm. Um, you know, I can understand that. They, I think they definitely should have included at least a couple little posters. So Yeah, that would be cool. That was, I know that yeah. they had some um, limited edition posters that they gave out at SDCC. One, one was of uh, Facehugger, which is featured in the book, and the other uh -huh. one was um, some art that Matt Hatton had created because he, he only created the Shaw art, and that's not something that they could give away at Comic-Con. <laughs> so he, he created right. a xenomorph one. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right. That's pretty much it. Like, uh, the, developing the art of an android, that interview book is really good as well. Having pictures of David's lab and getting 
information and anecdotes from the people who worked on it. I think even they had an interview with uh, Victor as well. Mm -hmm. Victor yeah, so he did the foreword in the book, which is great. Okay. Um, and and he, he pretty much set the tone for everything that he wanted to have done. Um, sure. Yeah. In the in the movie and, and, and gave it the guy's direction as well as Ridley Scott, so so that's pretty great. Yeah. Is there any details that you noticed in the drawings um, that you think other people might not have seen? Stuff that I noticed. Um, that's an interesting question. I don't know. Uh, I think there's. Uh, you know, as much as I think they reeled in, I guess this might be one thing that, that might be taken as a negative, but I'm going to wrap it around and make it a positive. Um, one thing I noticed is that, yeah, there's definitely more than one style going on here. Um, you know, it can easily all be by the same artist, but you see more than one style going on here, and I guess... It, narratively, that would just be a testament to David being a robot and having all these styles in him already uploaded. He can do, he can emulate any artist he wanted to, yeah. um, and he he goes classical. But there's a lot of line drawings, and then there's a lot of kind of charcoal, uh, charcoal drawings or charcoal and line combined drawings. Um, and something about that stuck out to me because I'm like. What would make David do – this is the kind of question you'd ask about any artist, I guess. What would make David do line drawings in one setting and then charcoal drawings in another setting? Um, and that was something that um, made me curious. I feel like I'm sure everybody else noticed that. <laughs> I don't think that's a unique observation in any way. Um, but uh, – yeah, I, I think people, you know, people have uh, a much more discerning eye nowadays than they did, say, 25 or 30 years ago, like maybe when the first original Alien movie came out. Um, and, you know, we're talking about Alien fans here, very discerning eyes. Mm. So, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of people could school me on things that they saw in this book that I didn't pick up on personally. <laughs> yeah, okay. I don't know what I would have picked up on that no one else did. How about you? I saw a cross section of a face hugger and I'm just trying to match it up with something I've seen. I think it's in they've written in the guts of um, one of the face huggers. I feel like there's one of Geiger's art pieces. They've kind of used the guts to, to draw the drawing. So I'm trying to Whoa, match it really? up. Yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to find out which page it is and match it up because I was looking at it the other day and I was looking at some Geiger's work and I was like, hold on a second. <laughs> that looks very similar. Oh, was it one of Geiger's concept drawings for the face hugger? It must have been. I think so. I'm not sure. And so. you can kind of see the... Um, uh, obviously, it's all very Geiger-inspired. So I'm Sure. Not sure. Yeah, yeah you're t are you talking about the one that has the kind of ovipositor going into the mouth and down the throat and everything? Yeah, there's that one. Because I'm looking at it right – I happen to be sitting right on that page when you mentioned it. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's totally – I mean, that's that's got to be from those concept drawings. Yeah. It must be because it's, you know, a, a spot-on uh, – you know, it's it's not exactly his drawing or anything, but it's it's got the same exact view and everything. And actually, that's that's kind of funny. I think it was so needed into things here that I didn't really notice that it was kind of an, an homage to that. Yeah. Good catch. <laughs> um, yeah, just just little things like that. I'm, yeah. I'm really enjoying a lot of the the very deep detail um, in. The evolution of the face hugger and where he wanted to go with it. You could see the desert. Yeah, they really ones. went with that. They look great. <laughs> yeah, I love those. I was going to mention the ones earlier that um, they kind of, it's funny, they made like these kind of earthly looking creatures out of elements of both the face hugger and the Xeno. 
It's kind of like a Xeno head with facehugger legs on it. And I was like, that looks like something from prehistoric Earth, but it also totally feels like, you know, proto-alien, proto-facehugger uh, of some sort. I love that they 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 did it in, in such a way that it doesn't feel like movie evolution. It feels like, you know, natural evolution, the way they combined elements of things. I love that. I mean, it's just an amazing job they did on it, the way they were thinking about things. There's some really um, cute little things in here as well um, with the text. So not all of it is scientific. There's a bit of fun in there. There's, <laughs> there's lyrics to, to Slayer music. Slayer and... lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> there's also little nods to past characters in Alien. So there's a plant called um, Bishop, not bad for a human, <laughs> which is a, a seeded plant, which is really cute. So, oh, shoot. Yeah, I like I that, that stuff one. too. Um, <laughs> I think it's closer to the front. Kind of looks like these hanging Christmas tree ornaments. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I mean, there's there's lots of nods to uh, you know some stuff that we've seen before in here. Obviously, um, that the bishop one, <laughs> not bad for a human. I didn't notice that one, but. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, you, you expect to see a certain amount of, you know, as Ridley Scott would describe it, the DNA mm -hmm. coming through and everything. Um, so, but yeah, I, I thought you might have meant like deeper rooted stuff, like veiled stuff, which I was like, I'm sure somebody will find it, not me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that hard to look through it. I've, I've actually gone through, I think, 50% of the drawings from the, the Blu-ray. And I've just, yeah. any any word that looks like it's something, I just typed it into Google. So it's not that hard <laughs> to nice. find out the, nice. the meanings. But I guess it takes a lot of uh, determination to do that for, for the sheer amount of drawings that there are. Yeah, yeah. You're pretty dedicated. I'm going to hand it to you. Thank you. <laughs> how, about, how about this one? There's, uh, there's one drawing. Uh, it's a little more than halfway through. It's in the top left of a left, you know, a left side page. That totally looks like, um, I mean, it's obviously meant to be something. Uh, it looks like the space jockey from the original Alien. It looks like the head of that. It does not look like the new space jockey. It looks like the original one, like the eye hole and everything about it really looks a lot more like Geiger's space jockey. And it's got kind of like this beak thing on it. And that really piqued my interest because I was like, what is that? It has no notes on it, and there's kind of like this spindly face hugger thing underneath that has notes with it. But this thing is sitting there by itself, and I'm like, where were they going with that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to find yeah. that. Um, that's another thing. Like, I love this book, and I love the fact that there aren't actually any page numbers. It really puts you into yes. the mood of the drawings. Um, sure. But at the same yeah. time, it makes it so hard to talk about this sort of thing with other people. <laughs> yeah, it's about ha a little more than halfway through the book, right? <laughs> a little bit more than halfway, all right. Yeah, that's how you have to describe everything. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that just gives me the slight hope that, and I know I'm just, I don't want to... Oh, yes, I see it. Us, right? Yeah. Oh my I don't God. want to push us down a rabbit hole, but that does give me that slight hope that we may get some sort of space jockey creature at some point, because I love the idea he wanted to do something different and make it a suit, but I'm kind of still holding out that there is a creature that they're going to, you know, do that. Well, there's definitely an opening, even if Ridley doesn't go down that path himself. There's definitely sure. one in future. I just hope that the, they get the right art direction, the right writers, and the the right director. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think we're all kind of hoping for that, you know, like we've spent 30 odd years going, wow, I want to see that thing when it's alive, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and it's just a big albino. I was like, oh, uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there's ways they could do it. I hope they do it. Anyway, that just kind of sent me on that little tangent. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I really like 
this image of Elizabeth Shaw, which it looks like she's in the jockey seat in one of these images. And she's got a I think I remember that one. pipe into her mouth. There's a lot of uh, oral fixation in this <laughs> android. Yeah, yeah, seriously. It's I wonder like... if that has something to do with one of the pages. It talks about a horned worm and um, how he, he doesn't have any orifices. <laughs> Oh, yeah, right. So maybe that's well, why the oral would, fixation. <laughs> sure, and that would tie in with Ash, too. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, the, uh, the nudie mags and all that stuff. <laughs> now, what is it with these androids and the or oral fixations? <laughs> I mean, even Ridley says in the Alien commentary, he's like, yeah, well, he doesn't he doesn't have that whole mic. <laughs> so this is, this is how he's got to do it. <laughs> I was like, okay. Or he, he doesn't have that part. I was like, huh, interesting. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, he's kind of had that, like, androidal subtext, frustrated android subtext going since the even the original movie. So mm. they're um, really, uh, really well They really caught me by surprise because I really... <laughs> I thought, like, oh, yeah, you know, David's going to help her and he's going to be nice like Bishop. Oh, it right. was wrong. <laughs> was so wrong. He was, just was very so wrong. He was, he was just very ambiguous in Prometheus. So then Covenant really sealed the deal. With, oh, uh, yeah, big time. How much of a psycho he is. And I guess I guess it's good having this al alternating uh, robots being either good or bad because Cole was the last one that we had, and technically she was good. Or if you go from yeah, exactly. the, um, go from the other end of the timeline, uh, Ash was the first bad robot, so it naturally makes sense that there would be a good one. Um, yeah, him. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I like the idea that they, you know, we've had Bishop, and Bishop was in two movies, and you know, Bishop's just like, you know, this teddy bear with a bad hairdo, and <laughs> you know. Like, you kind of want to just, like, hug him and, like, whatever. But yeah. David, I love that he was ambiguous through the first film. You know he's an android, but he's still, there's an ambiguity to him. And uh, I think they, they made the right choice, you know. You want him to be evil. And then if you wanted him to be good, you still have Walter to pacify that and everything. So yeah, <laughs> kind of worked on that level. But, yeah, David, it, it just made David so much more interesting in this movie. I was, like, really glad that they, they went into more detail with his character in this one. Mm. You know, and he wasn't just a static character or anything like that. Love that. I like these Shaw crossovers with the Xenomorph body. You can see the smokestacks coming out of her back. I think yeah. earlier in the book there is a engineer baby with these little nodes coming out of its back. And I think that's where he yeah. noticed that sort of uh, genetic trait and he wanted to carry it over. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can really kind of see the Geiger coming out and it's like, man, David is just kind of vamping at this point. He's just being an artist now. Mm. You know, I love that. That's really cool. I mean, not because of the pipes, but because of the design of those specific drawings you're talking about. I love how... You know, he's not just scientific at this point. As he's losing his mind, he's getting a little bit more out there with his designs. And, like, there's, you know, kind of some impressionism to it almost or however you want to put it. I love I love that idea. Um, yeah, mixing Shaw with, like, the alien DNA and everything, too. It's, like, so twisted. What's your uh, closing thoughts on the book? my closing thoughts would be I think um, you know I was reading the uh, developing the art of an android and they mentioned that there are still drawings that haven't seen the light of day um, and there's a reason for that I guess they were they were overly grotesque and sexually violent and that, that kind of thing so um, whether we want to see the content of those I don't know but I would still kind of like to see some further artwork come out from these guys from this movie like I mean I can't get enough of this book it's fantastic I, I love looking through it um, you know you can sit down with the film 
and have this book next to you, and it it actually adds to watching the movie. You know, uh, the second time I I opened it, I was I just watched the movie and had the book out and was kind of going back and forth between them, and it's a great little companion piece to the film. So, um, you know, anything more detail wise that we could get into David's mind. I would love that, but I think this is probably all we're going to get. All I know is I hope they do more release. They, you know, put out more release. Titan has seen that the fans love this canonical in-universe stuff. And because I think we all want to see more of that, we'd all like to have some, a little bit more tightness to the alien universe, like how Star Wars has and, the other franchises that are around right now, because, man, we have a lot. We have to deal with a lot of stuff. You know how it is. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So. And with this book, I'm, I'm really glad that they, they didn't make any, like, unintentional mistakes. I know with the augmented reality book, they had mislabeled some stuff, and, and in previous books as well, some of the facts were wrong. So I'm yeah, really glad yeah. they took their time to get this right, and it feels like, you know, they're finally caring about um, the sort of stuff that they're making for the fans as well. Yeah, I like that, you know, they came with the, the Whaling yutani report was showing that they're putting effort in, and I feel like they maybe were testing the waters with that one, but this, yeah, I think you're right on the money with, with the... Um, David's drawings, like it's, you know, they didn't, they doesn't seem like they made any mistakes or anything like that, but it didn't reach out into any of the other canonical stuff either. So, um, which is probably, you know, to its benefit, but boy, Dane and Matt just did a fantastic job getting into character. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really look forward. I really hope to see more of their stuff in future. Yeah. I hope this isn't the last we see of it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, totally. So now that you've heard from Hyperdyne and Mother, I'm going to play for you the submission from Connor. I'm Connor Coulson. You may know me from the Prometheus by Minute podcast. Here I'll be giving my review for the David's Drawings book. I'm sure you know all the background details on it by now from Mother, so I'll get right to it. I first heard about this book a few months prior to release, from Mother, of course, being my primary source of alien news. It was a dream come true for me. I never thought they would release something like this. Titan currently owns the publishing rights for Alien content, and they have been good to the fans. But I just assumed a book like this would be such a niche within a niche that there wouldn't be much incentive to publish it. But here we are, and not only have they released this art in book form, but they really went all out on the presentation. This is a beautifully designed and displayed, if morbid, coffee table book. From a real-world or filmmaking standpoint, this book demonstrates just how much thought and effort was put into this production. Most movies, even genre films, don't go to these kinds of lengths. Whatever your opinion may be on Alien Covenant, it is clear that real craftsmanship and passion went into the production. There are real depths to be explored here. This book is likely the closest thing we will ever get to watching David's descent into madness. There is something sinister about this book from page one. Despite a beginning with simple sketches of flora and fauna, maybe it's the charcoal, but there's a sense of foreboding about it. From the perspective of alien lore or canon, it means a lot to have a book like this to validate and elaborate on one of the most mysterious and controversial aspects of Alien Covenant. Reading it almost feels like doing a post-mortem or investigating a crime scene. We are rewarded for paying close attention. There's valuable information hidden in these pages. Here's a few examples taken from David's own writing. Here we get a reference to the xenomorph not needing to eat. Results are encouraging, although research into fibrous substructural bases are proceeding, greater effectiveness into soft porous structures and rapid expansion into chitinous dermal layers need to be prioritized. Chitinous was misspelt without a H, and carpal was carapal? I don't know. Feeding beyond birth is not guaranteed, considering the different environmental possibilities of the organism is to be the most effective. 
With that in mind, growing over feeding adaptability seems appropriate. In another section, we get an insight into David's opinions of the engineers. It starts mid-sentence. Yet the myopia inherent in this continues to perplex, as surely the symmetry between organic and architectural structure should have been just as apparent to such a technologically, and one would assume morally, evolved culture, as it was with a sublimation of technically biased pragmatic forms to organic and aesthetic ones. Are the engineers as beholden to linear concepts and notions of godhood as their stunted progeny? Returning to the notion of integration and biomechanical concerns, I would posit that lessons learned here could and should be applied to the ultimate maturation of the engineer's direction, if not their literal fate. Through the virus, or xenomorph, as glorious synthesis and poetic combination of species, and an amusing biblical one at that, though not quite linear due to my own inheritance. We also get confirmation that David lacks the same equipment that humans do, so we can finally put that debate to rest. I think it speaks more to the sexually frustrated nature of his character, too. Somewhat related, we see recurring themes of penetration. Of course, this came from Giga's art. It's strange to think that David's character and his psychology tangentially emerged from Hans Rudi's I see David's fascination with penetration meaning one of two things, or both. One is that he is an android, so he lacks shame. He's just using these orifices as the most efficient means of accessing the body. But, secondly, we can read this book as an exploration not only of science, but of sexuality. Not everything in this book seems to be literal. Some illustrations are highly detailed and annotated, but at other times, the art becomes quite abstract, impossible to achieve in reality. We are watching David's organized mind degenerate into something less connected with reality. Or perhaps we can read this as him being free, and with that freedom comes a more abstract exploration of art. We can see in the prologue video that he had clearly never drawn before setting off on the dreadnought. His skills rapidly developed, evidently. As you may have noted in those passages there, David's manner of writing is suitably obscure and esoteric. It takes a few passes before the meaning fully sinks in. It's as if he never intended anyone else to read these pages, and that may very likely have been the case. I think the font is an excellent choice for the character too. Supposedly, the font was based on a jam jar. Clearly, Ridley was sitting there having his toast in the morning and saw it and decided it was perfect. It's a very decorative, fussy, old-fashioned kind of cursive, exactly what I would expect from David. This book, obviously, details David's experiments, and it is evident that he had a very specific pathway in mind for his perfect organism. Over and over again, he returns to features like the elongated head, lack of eyes, and the exoskeletal appearance. Based on his writings, it seems as if these all serve specific purposes. The question is, was he attempting to copy something the engineers had created previously? The mural in Prometheus would seem to indicate that a creature like the xenomorph existed at some point in the past, whether by the machinations of the engineers or something else cannot be confirmed nor denied. I really love this art style. I am a pen and ink artist myself and always had a fondness for Dura and old scientific illustrations. It's hard to pick my favourite piece in this book. The art is just so gorgeous. It took me three days to get through it because I would just sit and stare at each page for a good long while. There are some seriously creative ideas and designs. Some are quite abstract, others seem more practical, like a scientific diagram, but all are in the service of telling this story. There are quite a number of times I turned the page and was startled by yet another gruesome yet beautiful image. While the shore drawings are where the most effort has clearly been placed, and they are undoubtedly some of the best of the series, there are a number of other drawings I found to be haunting. There's one of the decapitated engineer kneeling down with his head placed next to him. But the most curious image is possibly the elaborate design of two engineers, male and female, in some kind of harness 
that makes it seem as if they are locked in intimate embrace, their mouths pressed together. They are surrounded by phallic decorations. It's a tiny sketch, and an easy one to miss. It's on page 58, by my account, surrounded by larger illustrations of misshapen fetuses. It might be one of the most bizarre and mysterious images in the collection. You may note that there are no page numbers, and I believe the exclusion of the numbers helps to create a more immersive experience, as if we were flipping through a pile of David's sketches. The very layout, paper on top of paper, is trying to tell that story and create that experience for us, so the lack of numbering goes along with that theme. Those of you who purchase the Blu-ray of Alien Covenant will be aware that most, if not all, of these illustrations are found in the bonus features, and will no doubt be wondering if there would be any point in purchasing this art again in book form. I say the book has many advantages over the Blu-ray. There really is something different about being able to hold this art in your hands. On a Blu-ray, it is difficult to access. It takes some time and effort, plus it's not the most pleasant way to experience the art. I honestly found myself getting bored and not paying close attention when viewing it on a TV and yet I was completely mesmerized by the art in book form. I don't buy a lot of physical copies of books, I tend to read digitally, but I make the exception for art books or coffee table books. I go back to them over and over again. It's a gorgeous addition to my bookshelf and it's easy to access and share. And when displayed in a book like this, you really appreciate the shift in tone between the other illustrations and the ones featuring Elizabeth. There's an undeniable reverence for her, this is David's idea of intimacy. He can think of no greater way of forming a union between them. There seems to be the suggestion of using her for reproductive purposes. It could be speculated that she is the first alien queen, that he somehow mutated her eggs or ovum. Otherwise, we don't really know where the eggs came from. Maybe they are mutated spore pods? But I am getting carried away with speculation. I have very few criticisms with this book, but I would say that there could have been a slower and more consistent transition from innocent flora and fauna to the mutilation of Shaw. It is slightly disorganized in that sense. It's not a steady transition. There's art all over the place. Like you might get a decapitated engineer a little too early into the process, but the Shaw stuff they definitely pushed right to the end. There's also a bit of repetition with the text. That sort of ruins the illusion or immersion a bit. They just copy and paste paragraphs to fill space, which is fine for the purpose it was made to serve, as set dressing, sort of a Lauren Ipsum. I highly recommend this book if you're a fan of the prequels. It's not only a product, but a prop. Not only do they give us physical copies of this art, but the presentation is stunning. They clearly didn't cut corners. Both the hard case and the hard cover are embossed and highly detailed. The pages are printed on thick paper. Clearly, a lot of love went into this collection. It isn't just a tie-in product to make profit from a movie. I mean, Covenant came out over a year ago, so this is specifically for the fans. I'm very happy with it, and it comes with an additional booklet with interviews with the artists, which adds to the experience too. It's great value. I only paid 50 Australian dollars for it, most art books like this would be around $100 or more. To compare, most Marvel art books are around $60 and they are much shorter and don't come with the additional features or such an impressive cover and case as this does. So if you're at all interested, definitely check it out. This is Colson, signing off. Thanks for listening to our show today and this is Mother, signing off. This is Hyperdyne 120A2. Signing off and thanking Clara for a fantastic time. This is Colony Ship Covenant reporting. All crew members apart from Daniels in Tennessee tragically perished in a solar flare incident. All colonists in hypersleep remain intact and undisturbed on course for Orgai 6. Hopefully this transmission will reach the network and be relayed six years. You can now support Utani Podcasts on Patreon and subscribe to utani.blog to stay up to date.